السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. It's my privilege to uh, welcome you, as well as all the people who are watching us online, to this series on science from Allah, history, science, and the soul in Islam. Today's presentation, inshallah, is going to be about the madrasa, the educational system in Islam, from a historical perspective. The title of the presentation is The Seven Lives of a Madrasa. Because when we scan Islamic history, we will find that the educational system in Islam has gone through at least seven easily discernible stages. Why is that important? It is important because the way we teach and what we teach has an impact on the kind of product we produce, the kind of individual we produce. Each of these seven ages, we'll see, has a certain archetype. For instance, to illustrate what I mean by archetype, if we ask someone around the world who would be the archetype for the current American civilization, probably a large number of people would say it is Bill Gates. Why is Bill Gates the archetype? because he represents the crystallization of the American ethos. Success, capitalism, investment, drive. Similarly, when we look back at Islamic history, we'll find the emergence of these archetypes at critical moments in Islamic history, which determine the shape of the culture and politics of the era. And conversely, they are also influenced by the culture and the politics of the era. I'll bring it down to earth. People ask me, why is it that Pakistan, for instance, today, is not living up to its potential? Ask yourself, if I were to ask you, there are so many Pakistani brothers here and sisters and watching us. Who would be the archetype of the current Pakistani civilization? Is it Jinnah? Is it Musharraf? Is it uh, uh, Sharif? Is it uh, one of the religious ulama who have influence in Pakistan? I'm sure we would be hard pressed to identify a single archetype that represents current Pakistan. And as we go into this development, we'll see how through the centuries, Muslims brought together various disciplines to evolve the archetypes. It will be a brief introduction, and I hope all of you will go back and do research and further connect the dots. Let us start with the passing away of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After the Prophet passed away, we have covered that in a previous session, there was a vacuum that was filled by the consensus of the Sahaba. There were differences of opinion that gave birth to the Shia Sunni split. And then, after a while, after the turbulence of the civil wars, things settled down. And the Umayyads came to power. Now for our current session, we can define the Umayyad period into two separate categories. The early Umayyad period, based in Damascus, and the later Umayyad period, also based in Damascus. The early Umayyad period, lasts from approximately 
765, 770 of the Common Era till about the end of this century, or if you want to extend it, till the advent of Omar Abdul Aziz in the year 717, approximately 40 to 50 years. This was the period in which the archetype was either a companion of the Prophet, the Sahaba, or one who learned from the companions of the Prophet, the Tabi'in, or those who learned from the Tabi'in, the Tabi'in, Tabi'in. We know, we have covered this in our session series in here, during the time of Hazrat Omar Adelawandu, Hazrat Omar Adelawandu trained teachers and he sent them to the far-flung corners of the expanding Islamic empire to teach people the example of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Theirs was the age of light because they had learned from the master, from Prophet Muhammad himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they were like reflectors. Since they had seen the Prophet, they had learned from him and what they transmitted was a reflection of what they had learned from the Prophet An example, Salman Farsi. Salman Farsi was a Persian, one of the greatest of Sahaba. He learned from the Prophet, and he transmitted what he learned to other people. Abu Dhar, the master of innate knowledge, inner knowledge, he in turn transmitted to other people. And I have seen in my travels the tombs of some of these Sahaba in places as far away as Samarkand in Uzbekistan and Istanbul, Turkey. These were people who knew the Prophet firsthand. They had seen him. And some people, especially in Sufi circles, they say, if you saw the Prophet, you're a Sahabi. That's the, that's the definition that uh, the, uh, some ulama have given to as to who is a companion. They passed away, as do all of us. Then came the age of the Tabi'in and the Tabi Tabi'in. We have also covered briefly the achievements of Omar bin Abdul Aziz, who was a Khalifa only for two years and three months. And yet he transformed the shape of Islamic civilization. The Arabs, in their conquest initially, did not impose the faith of Islam on other people. I have books. I'm willing to share them with you. If you were to plot the conversion rate in the Islamic domains versus time, you'll find there is a peak all of a sudden around the year 719, 720, 721. That is when Iran and Egypt became Muslim. Not at the time of Khulfa Rashid. Conversion did not take place so early. Why? Because Omar bin Abdul Aziz lived his life in accordance with the example of the companions of the Prophet. And some people refer to him as Omar the Second because he follows the example of Omar ibn al-Khattab then comes the next generation, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. This is the generation of Tabi Tabi'in. When somebody says Tabi'in and Tabi Tabi'in, please do not just look at, well, such and such was only the son of so-and-so or a daughter of so-and-so. No, it refers to a period. It refers to a class of people. Tabi'in refers to a class of people who learn from the Sahaba. Tabi Tabi'in also refers to a class of people. Of course, chronological is true, but it's more important to emphasize how they learn and what they learn. So reflect on the lives and the examples of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. We have shared with you Imam Abu Hanifa 
was not just Al Imam Al Azam. He was also a very wealthy merchant. And that should be of interest to us here, especially in Silicon Valley. You can be a billionaire and still be a great man of the spirit. He was a scientist. He knew about standardization. I have shared with you the examples of how he standardized the manufacture of bricks after he was asked to lay the foundation of the city of Baghdad in the year 760. He was a town planner. So these Tabe Tabirin were integrators. Always keep in mind the questions that I asked you in the beginning. So often we ask ourselves, why is it that they are so different? What was so great about them? And why is it that we are the way we are? In today's session, inshallah, we'll share some insights as to why it was like that. They, the Tabi'in, Tabi Tabi'in, they had confidence in their faith, in their Iman. When you have confidence, you open the doors. Let anybody come in. We're willing to listen to you. The Prophet ﷺ invited the Christians to come and pray in Masjid al -Nabawi. Are we willing to do it today? Why? One of the reasons is that our Iman is not as strong as the Iman of those Tabi, 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 and the Sahara. So they had the strength of faith. When there is no faith, there is no civilization. Please remember that. Faith. First thing is faith. Then, since they opened the doors, they were willing to listen. It didn't matter to them where the information came from, the east, the west, the north, south, Persia, Egypt, North Africa, Africa, India, it didn't matter to them. They listened to them. And they were willing to build upon it because as the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, to gain knowledge, go unto China if you have to. Meaning, China, distance, yes. Different, civilization, yes. China was not Islamic. Learn from the Chinese. So that was the first period. The archetype in the first portion of the Umayyad period was the follower of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Either a Sahabi or a Tabi or a Tabi Tabi'in. Then comes the latter part of uh, the uh, Umayyad period. This is the period in, in which the seed that was sown by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions and the Tabi'in and Tabi Tabi'in started to mushroom. And we have covered the development of fiqh. In the first hundred years of Islamic history, there were no less than a hundred different schools of fiqh. And these great mujtahideen, and I've shared with you the meaning of mujtahideen. It comes from the jahada, which means struggle. For instance, we say jahada Ibrahimu al madrasa. Ibrahim works hard in the masjid, in the, in the madrasa. Unfortunately, these things, these terms have taken on a political connotation, but we should know the meaning of it. If not, ask someone who knows. There are so many good Arabic-speaking people who are willing to share that knowledge with us. So this mushroom, and we see the development of the, the codification of the Sharia, application to various different political, social situations so that the usul al-fiqh, the principles of fiqh are codified and the jurists who would come in later years would have the tools at the disposal to tackle the problems. I have shared with you the five principles that were evolved by Imam Abu Hanifa and how these principles got tight as time went on with Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, and Imam Hamad. Then comes the 
initial period of the Abbasid dynasty, from 750 to about 850, about 100 years. The Abbasids consolidated their power, starting from Khorasan in the northeast. They were able to conquer and consolidate their power, and they founded a new capital, the city of Baghdad, because Damascus was far to the west. They felt the territories to the east also needed governance. Persia, Afghanistan, portions of Pakistan, Central Asia, portions of Eastern Anatolia, all of these had a large number of people. And during these people, you feel an influx of new Muslims. Persians from Persia, Hindus from India, Zoroastrians, the Turks are beginning to come in. Now the Turks were nomadic people from Central Asia. And uh, they would enlist in the armies of various different people at that stage. I'm talking about the beginning part of the 8th century. So you find the influx of Turks also in Islam. And from Egypt, the Copts, the Christians. And the ideas of the East and the West came into the fold of Islam. Once again, remember, our doors are open. All these ideas are coming in. And now the challenge before the intellectuals of the Islamic domains is to accommodate their beliefs in the face of challenge from the East and the West. And the biggest challenge, as I have shared with you, was from Greek ideas, rational ideas, Aristotle, Plato, great people. The Greeks perfected the discipline of rationalism. They put the human being at the center of human affairs, carried it to the pinnacle, and developed it to almost perfection. So the Muslims wanted to explain their belief in the light of Greek rational ideas. And I've shared with you how, on the one hand, they developed a very scintillating, a brilliant, great civilization. On the other hand, they fell flat on their face because they did not understand the limits of reason. And they started to apply it to matters of faith. You cannot do it. They did not understand the limits of time. They didn't know what time was. And they fell flat and were rejected with Khalifa al mutawakkil in the year 845, 846, they were disbarred, removed intellectually from the domain. And after they were removed, they were persecuted. Yes, and this has been our history. Unfortunately, our history has shown very few periods of tolerance, and long periods of intolerance. Why? There's a, there's a different that's a different subject. But it is a fact. They were persecuted and disbarred. But then, that's the, uh, the Mutazilite period, the hundred years of the first portion of the Abbasid domain, when the archetype was the rationalist. And who were some of these great rationalists of that time? The al Khwarizmi, for instance, after whom the word algorithm is named. So many of us here are IT engineers. We make millions of dollars building software. It is after the work of al Khwarizmi. Another example, Al-Kindi. He was a person of Jewish heritage who converted to Islam, founder of uh, chemistry, philosophy, great man. Examples. So the rationalists were the archetypes in the third period. Then, thanks to the repudiation, this is an important point that I'm going to share with you. Thanks to the repudiation of the rational thought, science and civilization flourished in Islam. So many people even today, they say, we are going to be rationalists. We are going to build our institution based upon reason. Alhamdulillah, reason is a noble factor. With the exception of the heart, nothing in Allah's creation is as noble as reason. But reason has limits. They did not understand the limits. 
when they repudiated it, they went back to the Quranic approach. The Quranic approach is not top down. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us signs. Everything is a sign. My sheikh used to tell me, look at that orange tree, that tree is talking to you. Do you hear it? Look at the river flowing right next door. It's talking to us. The rain that we had today is talking to us. Signs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to look at signs and through the signs, get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is science, S-C-I-E-N-C. -E science is bottoms up. It is not top down. It is built upon observation, then theorizing, then building a, an edifice, a theory based upon it, provided we remember the underlying assumptions of the theory. If Newton says F equals MA, force equals mass times the acceleration, we must also remember that's valid when the velocity is very small compared to the velocity of light. Assumptions. It also is predicated upon certain assumptions about the nature of time. So science and civilization thrive in Islam because it went back to its roots, the Quran. And hence, my appeal to all of the young people, those who are listening and not listening, Study the Quran. Make friends with the Quran. It is there. And in my opinion, every child should attempt to translate a portion of the Quran. You cannot translate it, but you'll learn. You'll learn the meaning, the inner meaning of the Quran. You'll see the dynamics of it. And I'll share with you the following also. So many of our great scholars have fallen into error by saying that the moving principle of Islamic civilization is, for instance, ishtiha. Moving principle is science. Moving principle is unity. No. The moving principle of Islamic civilization is the word of Allah. It is the Quran. It is the faith that we have. The faith gives us the energy from which comes the force that transforms a civilization. Where there is no faith, no civilization. And hence the teaching of the Quran, It is not just the rope, a static rope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided through the rope energy, guidance, wisdom. Whatever we know, we know through the Quran. Please study the Quran. Make friends with it. So, these great scientists, they applied the principles of the Quran and they built a civilization that lasted until the onset of the Crusades and the Mongol invasions in the 11th and the 12th century. That was the marvel of Europe. We all take pride in it. We invoke the names of great uh, physicians like Imam Razi. We said, Imam Razi, no. He, discovered the, the uh, underlying reasons for smallpox, or medicine, or inventions, or en engineering. We take pride in it, and yet, how many people really know why it was that they became so great? I'm giving you some insights. It was based upon the Quran. That's why it was great. They had the confidence, they had the trust and the belief, inner belief, to open the doors. The Baitul Hikmah, the house of wisdom. Why did they have the Baitul Hikmah? Why did they invite the scholars of India with the writings of Aryabhatta, or of uh, uh, Aristotle, or the Zoroastrians? Because they had that confidence. So, it is important to remember the basis of that a billion civilization. It was the Quran. It was that confidence that they had. Science is bottoms up. It is not deductive. It is inductive. 
Science is not deductive. Science is not philosophy. We all earn our PhDs because that's a remnant from the Middle Ages. But if we are in science, we should be getting a DSC, a Doctor of Science. Because if you study philosophy, you may or you may not become a scientist. That was the fourth period, you see. The archetype at the time was the man of science. And later, if there is time today or perhaps the next time, are related to the madrasa system also, what they study, how they study, and how they produce these kind of people. Now come the great cataclysms. First, there is the invasion from the West, which is the Crusades. Now people usually think of the Crusades, when they think of Crusades, they think of Jerusalem. And this is important. But did you know that most of the great battles of the Crusades took place in Spain? It was Spain which saw the first onslaught from the Latin West, starting with the year 1086 Toledo. The old capital of Spain fell. 1086, fully 110 years before the onset of what we call the First Crusade, which was directed against Jerusalem. So these invasions, first from the West, then going on to the first upon the Middle East, Greater Syria, Palestine, were a big challenge to the Islamic world. It destroyed the Islamic civilization of Spain. By the year 1248, most of Spain was lost, except for Granada. Except for a little small strip. If you know Spain, you'll see that in the little small narrow strip facing the Mediterranean the south, facing the Straits of Gibraltar, Sevilla, Hartaba, all of these great libraries that were lost, fell into the hands of the Christians, and they in turn established their Baitul Hikmah in Paris and London. Look up the chronology, I've given it to you in my Encyclopedia of Islamic History, historyofislam.com, when the University of Paris was established, when the University of Oxford was established, you'll see there were between the year 1100, 1200, 1250, that era. Why? Because of the translations from the great libraries of Cartago and Sevilla. If that was not enough, in the year 1219, there was the great invasion from the east, the Mongols. They were more, even more devastating than the invasions from the west. Within a matter of two years, 1219 to 1221, the Islamic world lost almost 80% of its territories, if you were to judge it by population. Samarkand, Bukhara, which means Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Western Pakistan, Iran, most of Syria, and they use the word historical Syria, don't think of today's Syria. Historical Syria includes the following countries of today. Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Israel. All of these, that's what, that's when we say Syria, that's, that's what we mean by Syria. Up to the outskirts of Jerusalem, lost 90% of the population, killed. No exaggeration, it's a fact. And I will go into how is it possible it was done. So, this destruction brought an end to the exoteric civilization of Islam, which was built upon science. The great scholars were either killed, libraries were burned, Baghdad lay in ruins, Mur, Bukhara, Samarkand, Syria, in Syria up to Damascus also suffered, but not as much, up to the outskirts of Jerusalem. Isfahan. All of these centers of learning completely destroyed. 
the ulama, dead, gone. So that civilization came to an end. And so, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect his word? The innate spirituality of Islam asserted itself. Even as Genghis Khan was retreating after destroying Bamiyan, for instance, in Afghanistan, he was instructed in the tenets of the Sawf in the year 1221. So for about 80 years, you see this great tug of war between the Christians, the Buddhists, the Armenians, the Muslims, and the Chinese to convert the Mongols to their point of view. For almost 80 years, great deal. I've written a great deal about that in the encyclopedia. Ultimately, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the end of the 13th century, the Mongols themselves converted and became Muslims. And they became defenders of the new faith. Now the paradigm changes, the archetype changes. The archetype now is the Sufi Sheikh. From the year 1220, maybe even 1200, even though we have Sheikh Abdul Khadr Jilan who passed away in the year 1186, and others who came before, like Ibn al-Arabi. Now Ibn al-Arabi lived through the, uh, the uh, part of the 13th century. Anyway, most of the great personages that we think of from the 12th to the 17th century were Sufi sheikhs. Abdul Khadr Jilan, Rahmatullah Sheikh Shaduli of Cairo, Rahmatullah the founders of the Nafbandiya order in Central Asia. So many of them. On and on. And in India and Pakistan, for instance, that was the period. We call the invasion of uh, Muhammad Ghori, 1186. After 86, the Muslim Sultanate extended over the Gangetic Plains and the appearance of Khwaja Mohinuddin Chishti in Ajmer from Multan, it gave impetus to the spread of Islam. So this Islam that was spread in India, Pakistan, and later into Indonesia, Malaysia, and Sub-Saharan Africa and Eastern Europe was Sufi Islam. It was not the classical Islam. It was not the ulama. They were all dead. These were the great Sufi sheikhs. Very often, they would go to a village and the local people would not welcome them, so they would stay outside of town. That's the reason why in the old days, now of course, urbanization has killed everything, you would find their old khanhas outside of town, their tombs outside of town. And through their spirituality, they converted not dozens, but millions of people. So the archetype for 500 years was the Sufi Sheikh. It was this period that produced the greatest contributions in poetry. You have Maulana Rumi, even though Maulana Rumi, strictly speaking, passed away in 1186, but we'll count him as part of it. Hafiz, Jami. It was this period that produced the Taj Mahal, the Bashahi Mosque in uh, Lahore, or the Jamia Masjid in Delhi, or the Fort in Agra, or the uh, Registan in Central Asia, or the Blue Mosque in uh, Istanbul. These were the contributions of the Sufi period. Then, remember this date. Inshallah, I'll elaborate on it some other time. 1684. Things begin to change. What happened in 1684? Three important things, and I will elaborate some of the time. Number one, that was the year Newton published his work in London. That was the year the Turkish armies, after the second siege of Vienna, were defeated, turned around, lost Hungary, and receded towards uh, Belgrade. Most importantly, that was the year when Aurangzeb published his Mutuwate Alangiri. 
Islamic civilization took a turn from the spirit to the outward observances. The beginning of a right-wing swing of Islamic civilization. So, whereas people used to go to Zaviyas to learn something about the Tasawwuf, now they're busy themselves with learning about fatwas. Those who could give fatwas became more important than those who could teach something about the condition of the heart. Again, there are reasons for it. I'm just paraphrasing it in here. The beginning of the decline of Islamic civilization. If you want to put a date, 1684. And since then, it has been an inexorable slide. You find in Arabia, for instance, the appearance of Sheikh Abdul Wahab. In Nigeria, you find the appearance of Uthman Dan Uduya. So many of them. All of them more concerned with the outward observances of the Sharia than with the cultivation of the soul. Now I'll give you another way to look at it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a body. Alhamdulillah. Beautiful body. He made us beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a mind, reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gave us a heart. When there is a balance between the mind and the body and the heart, you have a stable civilization. When one or the other is gone, then you have an unstable civilization. Tripod, please remember that. It was gone. So, with the overemphasis on the outward observances, it was as if Islam was paying attention to the body. <clears throat> with the decline came the domination from Europe. And as the domination incre increased, Muslims withdrew more and more into themselves because they could not compete in the sciences of the mind. They could not compete in the rational area. They could not compete in the scientific area. So they said, what we cannot compete with would denounce. Why do so many of the so-called mullahs denounce science? I've heard those denunciations in my own years. Because they don't understand it. What they don't understand, they denounce. Islamic civilization became one-legged, if you will. Instead of having a tripod, it started to stand on one leg and it got toppled by European civilization. And the more they got cornered, the more they said, this is coming to us from the Firangis, we're not going to learn from them. It is theirs. Don't wear a tie. All right. How many th examples can we give? It used to be, until recently, don't wear you know, these kind of pants. Wear a lot loose pants, too, when I was growing up. Anything that came from England was bad. That's what happened to us. That was the emergence of the Salafi movement, even though the Salafi movement has been around since the 12th century, starting with the movements in Syria, it really took roots after the year 1684. And then came the attempts to so-called energize, modify, or renew, not renew, but reform. People call it reformation. Nobody can reform Islam. Islam is complete. You must renew the faith. Muhammad Abdul of Egypt, for instance. Kamal Ataturk of Turkey, another example. Habib Bourguiba of Tunisia, another example. To a certain extent, even Allama Iqbal, in some of his writings. Each one of them needs a great deal of attention. All we have been trying to do is to catch up. So in this brief presentation, I have submitted to you a way of understanding how it was through the process of elimination, using the development of archetypes in the various different stages, seven different stages. Islamic civilization was gradually marginalized. And to round it up, I'll bring it back to where I started from.
us ask ourselves, Pakistan once again. I have written a great deal about the situations in Pakistan and about the emergence of Pakistan and so on. I would submit one of the reasons why there is so much convulsion in Pakistan is because you find in there people who live in all of these various different stages. You find people who live in the seventh century. You find people who are rationalists. You find people who are scientists. You find people who are Sufis. You find people who are Salafis. You find people who are none of the above. There is no defined archetype. It behooves us, you, all of the young people, and the young people, our children and grandchildren, to evolve that archetype in America. The archetype working within the Constitution of the United States will bring together the spirituality that is ours through the Quran, the sciences of the mind, mathematics and science, and history, and the sciences of the body, by which I mean the application of God's laws to the specific situation in the United States. And that can be said about any country, whether it's Pakistan or India, Egypt or whatever it is. That's the challenge. That's the paradigm. I hope it was useful. Inshallah, we'll continue on this the next time. I thank you so much for your kind attention. If there are any comments, I will learn from you, inshallah. There are so many scholars here and there, and there's so much that I need to learn from both our sisters and our brothers. Sir. Going back to your last lecture, could you comment on the role of Ibn Rushd? I mean, was he part of the same Mutazila movement or I mean, no. no? If no, I would not call Ibn Rushd Mutazila. Ibn Rushd was the greatest disciple of Aristotle. What we call Peripatic philosophy. Greatest disciple. He wrote commentaries on Aristotle ideas that were only inherent in the writings of Aristotle, he was able to expand. He is known in the Islamic world for his book, Tahafuz al Tahafuz, Repudiation of the Repudiation, addressing Al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali, again I'll be very brief, he did go too far, he made an error. Great man that he was, one of the greatest scholars that we have produced. But when it came to the issue of cause and effect, when he makes the statement that cause and effect happen simultaneously, that mathematically is an absurd statement. Nothing happens simultaneously. Because when you look at quantum mechanics, it takes a Small amount of time, no matter how small, if it happens at the same time, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. But to make the assumption, as did the Allah Sharais, for instance, that time moves discreetly, that's an assumption. It's fine. But no, it is an assumption. And using that assumption, Al Ghazali extends it one level further and he says, cause and effect happen simultaneously. The fact is that we as human beings live in the same bubble, physical bubble, as this all of Allah's kainat, all of Allah's creation. So even though cause and effect are apparent, they relate to us. It's only when we go outside of the bubble, when we become speculative about the mind of Allah, quote unquote, astaghfirullah, that, you know, when you can add those kind of questions, you can ask the questions, but you know, that domain belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, going back to your question, his contribution was to question the premise of Al-Ghazali. Unfortunately, the Islamic world did not listen to Ibn Rushd. The Latin West did. They became inheritors of the philosophy of the Greeks and of the Arabs and of Ibn Rushd, whereas we became inheritors of Al-Ghazali.
saying that we had much to study from Adam Kirk. Do do you just mean the the modernization? Much to study? Uh, of of Ad Ad Kirk. Mustafa Ad Kirk. Ad Kirk. Ad Kirk. Yeah. And but do you mean his his modernization? No, no. I didn't mean to suggest that much to study. I said he is an archetype oh. of this age. That's all I suggested. No, I didn't say, I did not say, if I said it, it's incorrect. I did not say, I did not imply that anybody should. Of course, we have to study the Marquis of Yochi. Achieved a great deal. Great man in terms of what he did in Turkey. He, but he was he put, to, to the Tariq Fox. He, he, was, he was really harsh to the Tariq Fox. So. Well, let's look at him positively. You know, if you study the, uh, the uh, History of Turkey, Ottoman Empire, between the years 1910 and 1924. You'll understand his contributions. He saved Turkey from disintegration. Turkey would have gone the way Syria went. It got divided into four parts, and you see it's still going on. He saved Turkey from, from that kind of uh, uh, destruction. That was his accomplishment, Turkish nation. And the price that he paid for it is getting away from traditional uh, Islamic learning. He secularized it, but let's look at his contributions. He was, in historical terms, a great man. Were it not for him, Turkey would have disappeared. From a, from a historical perspective. From an Islamic perspective, yeah, people I know, they say you know, he changed the alphabet, he you know, took uh, Turkey way far to the left. But I wonder if he had any choice at that point. Because the British Empire was uh, on its neck. The Greeks invaded Turkey all the way up to 1922. Uh, they went up all the way to Ankara. Yeah, it's a different, different topic. Sir? Can you make a brief comment on what is, what is the state of Muslims today? After all these... Confusion? <coughs> The state of Muslims today is total confusion because we lack the knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Hadith al Khudusi, I was an unknown treasure. I will that I be known. Therefore, I created knowledge. How much are we number one in knowledge? No. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The only purpose of human creation is to serve. Are we number one in service? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhizil lil nas, ta'amunana bil ma'roof, tanfa'an anil munkar. Are we number one in doing good deeds? No. Are we number one in telling people not to do bad things? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya, stand up firmly for justice. Are we number one in standing up for justice? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa tasmu bi hablillahi jami'u la tafarqu. Hold on to the rope that Allah has given to you and do not be divided. Are we divided? Yes. Do we hold on to the Quran? No. Do we know the Quran? No. I'm aghast when I talk to my, my colleagues, highly educated people, doctors, PhDs, and so on. Have you studied the Quran? No. You have read something about what somebody else said about the Quran. So my answer in one word, to the current status of Muslims is confusion. We need to get back onto the line. And the line is not what I say or somebody else says, it's the Quran. Studying it and following it in the context of where we live. Because the way we follow it here is not the same way we can follow it in Lahore or Delhi or Kuala Lumpur. That's my own submission. Sir. Well, a couple of questions. The first one um, was you mentioned the idea of an archetype. Um, and is that in the context of uh, you know, historically looking at a collective set of facts and saying this was the general trend, so that was the archetype that was prevalent at that time? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so then related to that, the corollary to that question, um, you know, in, in, the, in the, the entire set of sessions that we've had so far, we've talked about actions of indi individuals, 
right? We've not talked about actions of uh, the society as a whole, right? But when we look at an archetype, right, that's a collective as opposed to an individual. So the action is always individual, the decision is always individual, right? But we are drawing conclusions about society from it, right? We're, we're generalizing. So, I mean, to me, that is sort of an interesting interplay between the two, but it's also, I mean, it seems like um, we are, uh, you know, how would you say, putting our view of what happened on top of it rather than looking at what the people actually did? Good question. The thing is that it's, a, it's, a, it's didactic. It's a method of learning. Question? The question is, you know, so far uh, we have been studying the contributions of individuals, whereas when we look at archetype, an archetype is a, a, an expression of the collective uh, situation in the community. And that looks like, appears to be uh, perhaps uh, uh, a way of overgeneralization. I'm sort of paraphrasing in my own words. Uh, my submission would be that it is a method of learning. You know, we are looking at 1400 years of history. And it's a very complex history. We can easily get lost. We can easily take, for instance, Ibn Taymiyyah and study him for 10, 10 days if we wanted to. It's a way of making some sense in broad strokes as to how we got to where we are. It's didactic, it's a method of teaching, it's a method of learning. What I have tried to do in my approach to history, I'm a scientist by training, I was not, is to avoid the pitfalls of getting too bogged down with specifics, but to connect the dots, look at the events, the events happen, connect the dots, and ask myself, what is it a sign of? What can it teach us? And if we can communicate 1400 years of history with seven archetypes, that gives us a sense of the ethos of the age, the dynamics of the age. Why? That's a, that's a, uh, that's a step in the right direction. Incidentally, I should give credit to where I got this idea from. At Cornell in 65 to 67, there was a well-known Pakistani scientist uh, Iqbal Ahmed, very well known man, good friend of mine. He spoke of four archetypes, he was not talking about Islam, he was talking about the comparative um, analysis of uh, different societies. But the word archetype, I first heard from him, so I, even though he's dead for so many years, God bless him. That's where I got the idea from. It's a powerful idea. At least one question, please, sisters, before we go. You know, last week I asked her about, um, on a personal note, I asked her about what really Mu'tazila means, literally. What I know, you, you, know, found I, out about you that? asked that, and I heard it from my good friend, um, uh, Abdul Latif, he's a Syrian. Uh, he explained it, <laughs> but with my, my, with my br brain not having that kind of flexibility, I forgot. I'll write it down the next time. I'll give it to you. Can you illuminate us on the root word from Mutazila? Good for you, Harry. Inshallah. I'll, I'll try it again. Yeah. Quick question. Yes. Could you name any new thinkers and scholars who are shaping Muslims' mind right now? Good question. Can you just repeat the question? Can you name any great thinkers who are shaping the Islamic world today? Good question. It will take some time for a great thinker to emerge. There are uh, many good people, good thinkers, who are doing a lot of good writing. And out of this milieu, I hope will emerge one or two great people. Uh, we don't have the perspective when we look at our own age, we are within sure. it. We don't have the perspective of time. So our children and grandchildren look back and say, well, we have something in here. So each of us, I would submit, each one of us, your sisters, brothers, and so on, must make his or her contribution. Because Allah says in the Quran, it does not cost him to 
we have forgotten the movement of an ant on a rock in the dead heat of night. We never know whose little contribution would be the greatest contribution. So never think that what you're doing is small. Do it. Write it. Work together. And who knows? That may be the ant that moves the rock. We don't know. I would like to thank you once again. Alhamdulillah, it's been a good session. I had notes that somehow you give me the energy and this energy back to you. And we have sheikhs in here, seated, uh, Sheikh Arabi, and, and so many doctors and PhDs and so on. If I said something right, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me. If I said something wrong, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me.